This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Program is made possible by the generosity of Los Alamos National Bank. We're coming to you today from the Los Alamos Police Department, the offices of Los Alamos County Emergency Management Coordinator, Phil Taylor. Um, and we're going to talk about the interactions between Los Alamos County and Los Alamos National Laboratory with regards to emergency management issues. Uh, Phil, welcome to the program. Well, thanks, Carol. Um, why don't we start out? Uh, I would like to just give the audience a little background. You, your father was a career United States Air Force um, a person who went through, uh, you ended up taking all of your childhood throughout the United States. Uh, you went to three high schools in two countries, including Okinawa, Japan, um, graduated uh, from high school in Klamath Falls, Oregon, um, and then you enlisted, uh, um, attended college on the Vietnam era GI Bill following a four-year enlistment. Was that in the Air Force? That was in the Air Force, yes. And uh, graduated... Before I saw the light. Okay. Graduated from Monterey Institute of International Studies in, with a bachelor's um, of art degree in Chinese. In Chinese, yes. And uh, what was that? Why, why did you pick that uh, language? I, I, th I think, well, uh, it probably started while I was uh, going to school in, in, uh, on Okinawa, and, and you had that uh, very close interface with the, with the local population. I was, it got me interested in uh, East Asia. And then, of course, the, the, probably the, the bellwether uh, event of my generation, of course, was Vietnam. And um, I, I was curious growing up, uh, just why, why, are, why were we involved in Vietnam? And, and um, as I, when I entered college, uh, that was one of the things I wanted to study was East Asian studies, particularly uh, U.S. involvement with uh, the greatest event of, of my generation at the time, uh, Vietnam, and how we got involved. And, and I found out that our, really the roots of that entire conflict, in fact, the roots of the Cold War, I think, can be traced to um, uh, some of the, the incidents in China uh, shortly before the end of the war. Um, with respect to uh, uh, our relationship with uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, General Stilwell, and uh, a whole host of other uh, personalities and events and history. And uh, I wanted to explore that further. And of course, uh, uh, later on with the Korean War and, and, and then the Cold War in general, I think uh, uh, one can trace its roots to uh, uh, that conflict and, and uh, our perceptions of communism, and uh, um, and and just the whole uh, struggles uh, in in East Asia with respect to nationalism, and uh, communism, and and uh, and capitalism, and how are all these systems, uh, the emerging democracies, uh, Japan, post-war, uh, uh, post-World War, uh, East Asian Pacific Rim, and how all that was going to play out in the 60s and 70s, and, and uh, I wanted to understand a little bit more about that, so long answer to a... <laughs> to a short question. <laughs> well, from there you went on to a career in the Navy, and um, quite a stellar career, uh, ended up uh, completing your master's degree in public administration from USC, and, and uh, worked um, for the Department of Emergency Services for Queen Anne's County, Maryland, managed their 911 center, EMS, and emergency management. Uh, and you uh, were involved in some disasters, the Arab-Israeli peace talks on Y Island. Yes. Uh, can you briefly say what that was about? Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State, Bill Clinton uh, was president, and um, the negotiations were among uh, of course, the United States, uh, the Israelis, who at that time were being headed up by Benjamin Netanyahu, 
Um, Yasser Arafat was present, along with uh, King, Hus King Hussein of uh, Jordan, and uh, a whole host of, of other folks uh, uh, were involved in that. And, and, and from the security uh, standpoint, um, we had to interface, local government had to interface with Secret Service, FBI, um, all the, plus the, 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 the principals of the various countries brought their security folks. So um, we had to have some pretty extensive uh, uh, briefings to make sure that, that everybody was on the same sheet of music and that there were no untoward events. I can imagine. So you went on to, um, uh, uh, you actually had personnel, during 911, had personnel deployed to the Pentagon? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was in your capacity in Maryland? Well, as, as, as the, uh, right, I was the Emergency Services Director for Queen Anne's County, which is about, uh, it's on the other side of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge from Annapolis, about a 45 minute drive to DC, depending upon traffic. And um, uh, several, of, well, not several, but I had a few of my folks who were also in, in military reserve capacities um, at the Pentagon. And, and uh, so these folks were, were certainly deployed to the Pentagon during 9-1-1. Uh, and, and we also did, well, the entire eastern seaboard at that time, particularly around Washington, D.C., um, right after the, in, in the days, weeks, and months following 9-11, uh, uh, were hyper vigilant, and there were a lot of uh, uh, interoperable or interoper what interoperation opportunities uh, that existed um, at that time. So yes, and six years ago you came out to Los Alamos and became the emergency management coordinator for Los Alamos County, and in that capacity you have quite a bit of interaction with Los Alamos National Laboratory. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about what that involves? Absolutely. Um, primarily, our, uh, from my perspective as an emergency manager, my uh, primary interface with uh, LANL is, is with the Emergency Operations Center. The uh, Emergency Operations Center since Cerro Grande, uh, which occurred in 2000, and the construction on the new Emergency Operations Center, which is where we are now housed jointly, um, really came about as a result of, of some of the uh, challenges and perhaps even dysfunctions uh, relative to, uh, relative to uh, Cerro Grande. The with big respect fire. To, right, with the big fire, um, there, were, there were times where there were multiple EOCs uh, EOC, there was an EOC on the county side, an EOC on the lab side. Um, sometimes they spoke with each other, sometimes they didn't. And, and you know, that's, that's very difficult and, 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 and frankly it is dysfunctional. I think that there should be, um, you know, we live in a very small geographic um, uh, location. We only have, I think the entire plateau up here is only about 165 square miles. And when you live in, in that small of an area, to have your major, you know, you've got the, the, the county jurisdiction and then you've got the lab. And, and that these two entities aren't um, joined at the hip and aren't operating um, uh, cooperatively is, is, is not a good thing. So um, one of the good things that came about as a result of Cerro Grande was the funding to build that EOC, which is a very, very nicely done state-of-the-art facility. And, and it was built from the be beginning um, with the uh, idea that it would be a shared joint um, operation out there. And so uh, since its opening, um, shortly after I arrived here in 02, um, we've been operating together um, we support the lab in a lot of their operations. They operate under the National Incident Management System. And we'll talk a little bit about that here as we, as we uh, proceed. But um, NIMS. NIMS, right. Uh, they have a very extensive at the lab. They have a very extensive what they call an, an ERO, an Emergency Response Organization. Uh, it's comprised of emergency response personnel, security personnel, facilities personnel, some of the scientists. Um, and the county plugs into that um, as it's appropriate. 
and, and because we all have a stake in this. You know, we're all involved in what happens up here. So we should all be at the, uh, at the nexus of, of uh, um, you know, how these, how these events are going to be resolved. And whether it's a natural disaster like uh, Cerro Grande or whether it's some other type of, of a significant event, um, it's going to affect both the lab and the county. Uh, we we kind of have to be in the same room anyway. And Phil, do you, do you all get together county emergency management personnel with la laboratory personnel to do tabletop exercises and, and plan and prepare for potential emergency situations? Absolutely. Uh, we plan with them. They plan with us. Uh, we, we, we uh, since I've been here, uh, we've had several, full, well, the lab will have a full-scale exercise every year, and every year uh, we go through this planning cycle with them um, and it's, in fact, I, I don't even like to say with them anymore. It's kind of among us. Um, we're kind of all joined in this, and so we all have a stake in this. We all have a stake in these exercises, and so we plan the exercises uh, jointly. We, we uh, respond to the exercises jointly. We, we respond to real-life events uh, jointly and collaboratively. So it's all part of the same process or cycle. And I know that um, as a way for not only Los Alamos County and Los Alamos National Laboratory, but other related agencies um, to get to know each other and kind of talk about various aspects of e emergency management and planning and so forth, uh, there is now in Los Alamos County a an organization that, that you belong to, um, the Los Alamos Public Safety Association, made up of a variety of entities. Could you talk a little bit about that? Right. The uh, Los Alamos Public Safety Association is kind of the brainchild of uh, our police chief, Chief Torpy. And, uh, chief Wayne Torpy. <laughs> right, Chief Wayne Torpy. Um, he's been on board now for, I think he just entered into his third year. and. Uh, he was really the start of all this, and, and it's a great idea. I mean, it's an opportunity for, well, from the county side, for example, we have representatives from the police department, fire department, emergency management, uh, county administrator's office. FBI. Um, F, well, I was going to get into that. Um, uh, we, we've had our own local attorneys, uh, even some county council members who attend. From the LANL side, you've got an entire alphabet soup of, of agencies involved there that you have their, their emergency uh, operations uh, folks, uh, counterintelligence folks, FBI, uh, protective force, um, uh, security, uh, safeguards and security personnel, uh, not to mention uh, the Los Alamos site office, uh, NNSA, uh, National Nuclear Safety Administration, uh, DOE, folks, Department of Energy folks, and uh, we have these monthly meetings, and, and you know, and, and what it really does is provide the, uh, the face, you know, you, you're actually meeting the guy face to face instead of it's just a voice on a phone, and, and um, you know, provides the opportunity to discuss some of these issues that really do concern all of us, and uh, it's a lot better to know, to have some kind of a personal relationship with the guy that you might be meeting at 2.30 in the morning out in the field. Um, in a and, crisis. And, in a crisis, and you don't want that, that, that shouldn't be the first time you've laid eyes on this guy. You know, it's, it's good to have had some kind of a, um, a relationship uh, that you've developed or nurtured uh, prior to that bad event. So that was the, the rationale for it, and it makes sense. Phil, I'm just curious, what drew you into the field of emergency management? Well, I, 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 th I think um, a lot of the uh, mechanics involved in emergency management and public safety in general, um, it's probably best to, for me to answer what, what drew me into public safety. And uh, the mechanics involved in public safety are a lot similar to the mechanics that I employed as a naval officer. As a naval officer, I spent a lot of time in, uh, in, in uh, uh, mission planning, um, you know, send out reconnaissance, uh, find out uh, uh, information on where the bad guys are, uh, what's their composition, disposition, strength, um, 
you know, figure out uh, what your what your resource requ what your resource requirements are going to be. Uh, muster your troops. What personnel are you going to need? The logistics involved, and uh, you know, plan the mission, brief the mission, execute the mission. A lot of those mechanics are directly transferable to the same sorts of uh, events that you'd confront in public safety, especially emergency management. Um, fighting a, a big wildfire, you're, you're employing a lot of the same mechanics that you use um, to assault a position. Um, you're still doing resource management, you're still doing reconnaissance, you're still doing tons of communication, uh, you're planning a strategy. Um, you know, those sorts of mechanics are, 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 I think, directly transferable. And that's what attracted me to public safety, uh, especially after I got out of the Navy and I finished with my graduate uh, degree and I had to find a real job. Um, I, I was uh, drawn to that sort of, and plus it's, it's fun, you know. <laughs> so you enjoy it and, and, yeah. it's a, and, yeah. and you know that you're really contributing uh, to the greater good because if uh, a community is prepared, it lessens the devastation when a, a crisis hits. Oh yeah, a prepared community is, uh, is a f what we in the Navy or in the military term that's called a force multiplier. You know, a prepared community means that uh, you've got people that, that, for example, they've got three days of food and water stored up in their houses so that if the electricity goes out because of a bad snowstorm, they can't get the Smiths. Um, they're going to have food and water. Um, you know, that's just a good idea, um, and and that is, that's less uh, means less activity for. It means the emergency management, mer emergency response folks aren't going to have to go to your house. You know, they might have to go to somebody else's house, but you're not going to be one of them because you're prepared, and that's what we're trying to get across to people. And Phil, since 9/11. How has the emergency management field changed? Well, the emergency management field has changed tremendously since 9-11. Um, in three ways, I think, and I, uh, I, it's become more bureaucratized, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that. It's become more formalized, and the scope has broadened. Um, it's, be, it's become more, bro more bureaucrat bureaucratized, um, because we, we've, we were, prior to 9-11, we were all, all 50 states, uh, all the jurisdictions, all the localities, we were moving towards standardization, but it hadn't happened yet. And by standardization, I mean um, common names for things, pro, uh, common nomenclature, uh, common programs. In other words, my, my emergency management program up here in Los Alamos was not necessarily the same uh, emergency management pro program that might exist in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, uh, the, the, the nomenclature, things that we, even, even things that we called things like, and I got a rude awakening when I came up here. I was from the East Coast. Um, we, uh, tankers, tankers mean a different thing up here than they did back where I came from. Where I came from, a tanker was a, a truck that carried a large, uh, several hundred gallon tank that you filled up with water that was used to put out fires. That was a tanker. When I came out here and I mentioned the word tanker, that had a whole different meaning. A tanker is an airplane that flies up over the fire. And, and so right away I had, we had a failure to communicate. Uh -huh. and, and so now the, 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 under NIMS, the National Incident Management System, which came about as a result of 9-11, uh, there is unique nomenclature used so that there's not this kind of confusion, this regional confusion, because you can expect on a large incident to have crews from all over the country uh, responding up here. And so uh, it makes sense if we can all talk the same language, that a tanker to you is the same thing as a tanker to me is the same thing as a tanker to Johnny. You know, that we're all talking about the same thing. Because that could be critical. Absolutely. And it could cause a disaster in certain circumstances. Well, and that's exactly right. And so, so like I say, it's become emergency management, emergency response has become more uh, standardized, more bureaucratized in a sense, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, we now have the national response framework. 
which came about as a result of uh, a variety of Homeland Security presidential directives um, as a, to get everybody talking on the same page, uh, to get all the response entities that might respond to a large event uh, speaking the same language, uh, that um, a coupling in, in, in for this vehicle is the same, uh, means the same thing as a coupling or a fitting uh, for this device or this piece of equipment, and that we're all talking about the same thing, especially with, with logistics and resource management, uh, that's crucial. Um, and is that where NIMS comes in? If yes. everyone studied and, and, and um, took that program, so we're, we're certified NIMS uh, officers or whatever, then they, they're all learning how to be on the same page. Well, yeah, the National Incident Management System, actually, it, it, it's in, in, um, in, the, in a general sense, the National Incident Management System is based on an older, uh, what's called the Incident Command System, but it employs much the same uh, principles. It is a framework via which uh, emergency response personnel um, organize to uh, uh, address or confront the emergency. Uh, primarily, it has to do with the command structure, um, and you know, with the with the roles established, proscribed, and laid out. You have a, a hierarchy, a chain of command. Um, and it's established, and it's universal, and everybody understands it. And, and NIMS, or, or an, an incident command set up in, in Los Alamos for Cerro Grande, for example, is the same as as an inc as, as a incident command post in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or, or New Orleans, Louisiana, or anywhere else in the country. And, and again, it, it, it follows the same kinds of principles in, in common nomenclature, standard. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've moved away from jargon. Uh, we're not, for example, we're not using 10 codes. Cops aren't using 10 codes anymore because it's plain, uh, speak, uh, yeah. it's plain speak over the radio. A 10-8 a a in, in Los Alamos might mean something different in, you know, anywhere else in, in the country. So uh, everybody's using the same language and and it's hopefully to reduce some of the conflicts that might occur on the scene and uh, to enhance the response. And do you find agencies are since 9-11 are uh, freer about sharing information across agency lines or is that still a little sticky? No, I, I think it's it's evolving and it's, it's getting where it needs to be but um, you know uh, jurisdictions, agencies um, have had a parochial um, approach to this is my information and, and I'm a little bit uh, reticent to share it with other, other agencies, other entities. Um, and we're, we're, we're getting around that a little bit. We have, uh, and there's a lot of instruments, uh, f federal, state, and local. Uh, for example, here in New Mexico, we have a, a joint fusion center. A lot of regions and states are, are, are employing what they call joint fusion centers. Uh, New Mexico has one, Arizona has. I mean, uh, they're, they're becoming ubiquitous now, and it's just a means to uh, uh, share information across jurisdictional uh, lines. And we have monthly conference calls, monthly uh, meetings, uh, where you're in a room with with uh, FBI and different law enforcement entities uh, from all from, from of all different stripes, not just uh, you know local government, but but Park Service, Forest Service, um, Lanel, um, Sandia, Kirtland. I mean, a lot of these guys are and and they discuss these things, these areas of common interest, and uh, discuss chatter that they've heard. Um, and and share information. So so yeah, it has improved, and it's going to It's going to improve. Phil, we we just have a couple of minutes left, and I just kind of wanted to end by asking you, what you see as the biggest threat facing the U.S. or threats uh, today and into the foreseeable future. Facing the U.S. First of all, we're always going to have 
uh, natural disasters. I can guarantee, I'll, I'll go on record, I will guarantee that uh, within the next five years, there will be a Category 4 or a Category 5 hurricane that's going to hit somewhere on the southeast coast, uh, down from uh, uh, Hatteras, uh, Cape Hatteras off South Carolina, uh, could hit anywhere on that, on that Atlantic seaboard coast, uh, go around Florida, hit up into Tampa, hit anywhere in the Gulf Coast from, from Tampa over to Brownsville, Texas. I'll guarantee a Category 4 or Category 5 hurricane is going to do that. I can guarantee that, that we're probably going to have an earthquake, you know, hit somewhere between San Diego and Anchorage, Alaska, um, magnitude 6.0 um, somewhere. My understanding is yesterday, California, five million people took part in a, an exercise I've heard that too. to, I to how to react to an earthquake. So, well, it's just a, a, trying to be prepared. We're, we're going to have an earthquake. We're going to have a hurricane. Uh, I guarantee we're some, somewhere in the Midwest, around the Mississippi River Valley, Arkansas River, Missouri River, Ohio River, there's going to be a flood. I know that there's going to be a flood. I know that um, somewhere here in, in, we're going to have a we're going to have a winter storm. You know, uh, there's going to be somebody's going to get snowed in. Um, we're going to have a wildfire. We're going to have a wildfire some here, somewhere here in the Southwest, um, in California, uh, Colorado, Arizona, here, uh, New Mexico, Utah. Uh, the Pacific Northwest, we're, we're Northern California, somebody's going to have a wildfire. Santa Barbara, I mean, we're going to have a wildfire. So we're going to have these things. These are going to happen. Uh, we also have to be vigilant uh, against man-made threats to our security. I don't see any rollback of present-day uh, airport security. I think we're all going to have to go through that kind of hassle, inconvenience. They're still going to go through your luggage. You might still be taking off your shoes, going to have to go through the metal detector. I don't see that going away anytime soon. Um, I think that we're going to be continue to see uh, port security uh, measures. Um, you know, ports of Long Beach, uh, Seattle, uh, Oakland. I, I think they're you know, and on the eastern seaboard as well. I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. I think we're going to continue to see cyber threats. Um, you probably read in the paper where uh, there have been recent, you know, the, the Pentagon gets bombarded with uh, cyber threats every day. LATL gets bombarded with cyber threats every day. Uh, identity theft uh, and, 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 and school violence. Uh, you know, I, I think that these are realities. I think that things that we have to watch out for and be vigilant of and prepare for and plan against. Well, Phil. Our time is up, but I want to thank you. It's been very enlightening. I appreciate you being on the program. It was fun. And thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you again next time on Behind the White Coat Conversations with Los Alamos Scientists. This program is made possible by the generosity of Los Alamos National Bank.